From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Friday, June 12th. I'm Wayne Pratt. Missouri's governor is lifting all statewide coronavirus restrictions effective Tuesday. Mike Parson says it's time to reopen all businesses despite a rise in cases throughout the state. The health and safety of all Missourians will always be our number one priority. But as I've said many times, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our economy. Parson says local officials can still keep restrictions in place. We'll have more in just a bit. Also, we examine why immigrant meatpacking workers are afraid to speak out about safety concerns at work, even though many have been hit hard by COVID-19. As we mentioned, Missouri Governor Mike Parson says he is allowing all businesses in the state to reopen. As St. Louis Public Radio's Jacqueline Driscoll reports, restrictions put in place due to coronavirus will be lifted Tuesday. Despite a gradual rise in cases since mid-May, Parson says it's time to let all businesses open without restrictions in Missouri. At some point, government has to get out of the way and let people live their lives and regulate their own selves when it comes. We are at that time in the state of Missouri. Local officials will still be able to keep their own restrictions in place. And when it comes to large scale venues like NFL games or concerts, Parson says that'll be up to individual organizations. The Department of Health and Senior Services will be releasing recommendations in the coming days for nursing homes and long term care facilities, which saw the highest number of deaths from the virus. In Jefferson City, I'm Jacqueline Driscoll, St. Louis Public Radio. And Governor Parson is still recommending social distancing and wearing masks. Health officials in suburban Kansas City have linked a new coronavirus case to Memorial Day weekend parties at Lake of the Ozarks. An epidemiologist has told the Johnson County, Kansas Board of Commissioners the infected resident visited the same bar as a mid-Missouri person who also tested positive. Large crowds of mostly young people without masks and ignoring social distancing guidelines gathered at Lake of the Ozarks during the holiday weekend. Health officials have urged anyone who attended those parties to self-quarantine for 14 days. Mortality rates between black and white St. Louis residents are continuing to widen. That's from the author of a city study on the issue that was released last year. The researcher has examined the most recently available information, which shows health incomes for black St. Louisans have worsened over the past four years. Alderman Kara Spencer says she thinks the city needs to make future decisions based on those reports. We have read the report and we have failed to really address what should come out of it. And so from this moment, I think this committee should make a commitment to following through on all the action items. Those items include collecting fresh information the researcher says would help the city make more racially equitable health policies. St. Louis residents will be able to vote on a tax increase this fall to spend more money on early childhood services. St. Louis Public Radio's Ryan Delaney reports. The six-cent property tax increase would raise about $11 for every $100,000 a home is worth. The money would go to the city's mental health board, which already funds daycare, after-school, and other youth programs. Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard of the 26th Ward is the bill's sponsor. The $2.3 million that is kind of saying that we'll be able to collect from this levy, it's just a drop in the bucket of what we need to ensure a better start for a zero to five. The Board of Aldermen voted earlier this month to put the increase on the November 3rd ballot. Advocates for early childhood education are also pushing for a tax increase in St. Louis County. Some aldermen say the timing is wrong to ask residents to increase taxes during a pandemic and economic slowdown. I'm Ryan Delaney, St. Louis Public Radio. Many of Nebraska's largest COVID-19 hotspots are meatpacking plants with deep immigrant roots. Advocates say those communities are disproportionately impacted by the virus, but many workers have avoided speaking out during the crisis. As Harvest Public Media's Christina Stella reports, they fear they would lose their jobs, so it's up to their children to get the word out. Nguyenyo is a lawyer in New York City. But she grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and moved there with her family from Vietnam as a kid. Her dad got a job at the Smithfield plant in nearby Crete. These days, it's the biggest employer in town. 
She says she remembers the sound of his alarm clock going off. Sometimes I was having like I had a, a bout of insomnia that evening or that night, and I didn't fall asleep. But so then my dad's alarm would be go off, you know, and I would see him get up while I hadn't even gone to bed yet. He still wakes up before dawn for work, and over his 27-year-long career, she says he's kind of become an institution. He mentors young employees new to the job and is close with his managers, close enough to bring back trinkets when he attended his daughter's graduations. Every time we go on vacation, which we never do, he'll always want to buy something for his manager. But even as a massive COVID-19 outbreak has gripped the plant with hundreds of reported cases, she says her dad doesn't talk about it much. That's not new behavior. They've just put their head down and that's helped them survive. Many children of meatpacking workers say their parents are still scared of getting COVID-19, but also worry about getting fired for speaking out. Several companies like Smithfield have issued statements highlighting their pandemic policies, claiming they meet or exceed recommendations. But advocates have alleged many plants still aren't socially distancing workers and don't have enough PPE. Plus, some companies like Tyson still don't offer fully paid sick leave, despite recommendations from OSHA. Those concerns recently brought Myra Mendez, an organizer with the advocate group Children of Smithfield, to the steps of Nebraska's Capitol building. I stand as a proud daughter of two meat packing plant workers who immigrated to this country over 30 years ago with a single purpose, to provide the best for our family. She told a crowd of dozens that plants are a critical presence in many of Nebraska's immigrant communities, employing thousands. These meat packing plants have made it possible for our parents to put us through college, but we won't allow employers and government officials to classify plant workers as essential workers without treating them as essential lives. Two-thirds of those workers are immigrants, and many of them are Latino. The state doesn't specifically report these numbers, but advocates say immigrants working at plants, particularly Latino immigrants, have been disproportionately hit by outbreaks. Statewide, Latinos make up almost half of Nebraska's COVID cases. This is a deeply immigrant community that is uplifting local economies and putting food on the table. That's Tony Vargas, who represents a lot of plant workers from South Omaha in the Nebraska legislature. He says the state should have done more outreach earlier on. It took weeks for us to get Spanish language education material in certain places, let alone at the state level. Vargas's parents moved to New York City from Peru in the 70s and worked on factory lines. His dad eventually became a machinist, an essential job, just like the workers at Smithfield. He worked until the day he got sick with COVID and died a few weeks later at 72. He, he relished the American dream. If it wasn't for the American dream, I think he would have lost will and that's what kept him going. Now, Vargas says his grief feels bigger than him. It's a call to protect meatpacking families that aren't that different from his, from the trauma of COVID-19. And it's painful for me. Can't imagine what it's like for the family members and for the sons and daughters of workers. Nebraska doesn't release information about individual businesses, but nearly 3,500 workers have gotten sick with 14 deaths. The children of Smithfield and other organizers say they'll keep speaking out until working conditions improve for their parents. Christina Stella, Harvest Public Media. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. Before wrapping up for the week, we go back to one year ago today. For the first time in their history, the St. Louis Blues are the Stanley Cup champions. That is how it sounded on NBC 12 months ago when the Blues won their first Stanley Cup. Hard to believe it's been a year. This National Hockey League season has been suspended for months because of the pandemic, but the league is moving ahead with plans to hold the playoffs, giving the Blues a chance to possibly repeat as Stanley Cup champions. I'm Wayne Pratt. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.